So let's make a start. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming to the third event in our programme of Political Education on Trans Liberation. This programme is being organised entirely by trans people within Momentum, Labour Party Campaign for tra Trans Rights, The World Transformed and the Labour Party LGBT Network. My name's Felix, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a performer and an organiser for Trans Pride Liverpool and the Labour Party LGBT Network. I'm also on the steering group for this programme. This programme is going really well and we've got loads more exciting ideas, including working with unions to develop training specifically for their members and a big event celebrating trans people in the creative sector in January. So look out for both of those. You can read an article in Labour List out today, which talks about some of our reasons for running the programme in more detail. It would be amazing if you could have a look and share around. You can also see all of our work so far, including recordings of our first two events on the Resource Hub section of the World Transformed websites. We'll post links to both of those in the chat now. If you're a trans person or an ally who is interested in finding out more, then drop us a line on transpoliticaleducation at gmail.com. That's transpoliticaleducation on gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We want as many people as possible to participate in this program. So please do tweet about this event with the hashtag Watch Transphobia. So hashtag Watch Transphobia to help spread the word and tell your friends about the program. How is that transphobic though? Most of us will have encountered this phrase, whether it's in the comments section of another article, creating fake fights between trans and non-trans women, or during long and tense meetings where trans liberation becomes the hot topic of discussion. It's clear that within the left, as paralleled in wire society, there isn't a good understanding of what transphobia actually means, how to spot it, and crucially, how to challenge it. Ultimately, the lack of understanding harms trans people as we have to spend our own energy responding to comments that oppress us. At the heart of all of this, there is a basic truth. Transphobia can actually be quite hard to spot. It can appear in hidden ways, presented to us as legitimate concerns or dressed up in arguments claiming to protect other marginalized groups. With the lack of trans voices in the media or politics, the so-called debate around trans liberation is heavily skewed against us. All of this, of course, takes place in the context of increased hostility towards trans people in the UK and around the world. Trans people are more likely to experience the lasting impacts of austerity, be it through a lack of access to healthcare, safe housing or security and work. A recent report suggested four out of five trans people in the UK have experienced a form of trans hate crime over the last 12 months. This mirrors an infamous report from 2019, which found that transphobic attacks had trebled in recent years, with almost half of these being violent offences, ranging from assault to grievous bodily harm. We need to get better at challenging transphobia, and in order to do that, we need to understand it. So this evening, we are asking, what even is transphobia? How does it appear in different parts of society? And how can we challenge it and build solidarity between trans and non-trans people? I'm really excited to discuss these questions and more with some amazing guests this evening. First up, we're going to cover some 101 on transphobia with Shay Brown, director of Transactual, who has worked on a crowdsourced definition of transphobia. Then we'll be talking about how transphobia supports and is supported by modern right-wing politics, including the far right with writer Sean Fay. Then we'll be talking, diving more deeply into the UK media. Why is it so transphobic and what can we do about it with writer and filmmaker Juliet Jacks. Finally, we'll be taking a different look at perspectives within feminism and how a feminist understanding of gender can help us challenge transphobia with black feminist and researcher Lola Elofemi. I would really love to hear from you all this evening. So please, as the speakers are talking, write your comments in the Q&A box as I will do my best to ask them. We're aiming to finish by 7 p.m. this evening. So sorry if we don't get round to your question in time. Right, 
Let's hear from our first speaker now, Jay Brown, Director of Transactual. Thanks so much for joining us, Jay. So can you talk to us through some of the basics? What is transphobia? Why can it be so hard to spot? And why did Transactual crowdsource a definition for it? Yeah, so transphobia, so as you quite rightly said, is really hard to define. It's more than just a T word, and it's more than a punch on the nose. It can be subtle, it's often really nuanced, and crucially, it can be dressed up in a way that seems really quite reasonable to the uninformed bystander. And this is something that really hit me when I was in a workshop on tackling media prejudice. And I was asked to share an example of a transphobic article. I chose one that felt really, really obvious, full of loaded language, full of insinuations. And yet it really quickly emerged that what was obvious to me wasn't at all obvious to the people I was explaining it to, who didn't know much about trans people and our lives or anything around the discussion. So it was that moment that led to the creation of Transactual's crowdsourced definition of transphobia. And it was a real collaborative um, effort written by, um, written up really nicely by one of Transactual's um, volunteers, because how can we possibly challenge transphobia if people don't understand what it actually is? So there's the obvious things, things like verbal abuse, assault, harassment, discrimination, they're in the definition of transphobia, obviously. And it's crucial that we do talk about those aspects of transphobia. And when we do talk about those aspects, it's so important that we talk about the dis disproportionate level of violence experienced by trans women and femmes, in particular, trans women and femmes of color. However, because these are the more obvious aspects, I'm gonna spend a bit of time now talking about the more subtle aspects. I've got about seven minutes, so I can't tell you the whole definition, but I will drop the link um, to the transactual definition in the chat later. So a really common transphobic approach is to seek to restrict trans people's ability to even define transphobia for ourselves. We've seen it in the press, from high profile individuals on social media and even in our trade unions. These restricted definitions of transphobia often ignore the sort of dog whistle transphobia that I'm gonna be talking about today. So transphobia shows itself when people attempt to remove trans people's rights, that's quite obvious. And we've seen it through campaigns that have intentionally conflated the Equality Act and the Gender Recognition Act, which are ultimately um, unrelated. We've seen it in litigation to limit trans young people's access to puberty blockers and we've seen it through employment tribunals attempting to defend transphobic behavior as a belief system to be protected under the equality act and the thing is with these transphobic campaigns they can cause physical harm to trans people hate crime against trans people has increased fourfold and the fact that this has coincided with an increase in press transphobia and societal transphobia is absolutely no coincidence. Now, these claims where there's some sort of conflict between trans people's human rights and those of any other group, they're often based in transphobia. And you'll see this term concerns. This is a giveaway, concerns, where the term is used often without evidence to support it. And it quickly becomes clear that when you sort of dig down into it, these concerns are neither justified nor valid. And often those expressing those concerns for a particular group, for example, um, women and girls who aren't trans, often they're speaking over or ignoring people from that group that have already said it's not an issue. Now, You've mentioned the media and stories about trans people in the media are often really one dimensional, frequently portraying trans people as a threat. There's deliberate language choices going on there. For example, headlines like children sacrificed to appease powerful trans lobby. And articles about trans people who have behaved violently are used to portray all trans people as dangerous. And this misrepresentation about trans people in our lives extends to the misuse of statistics, of research, of the law. I've mentioned conflation between the Equality Act and Gender Recognition Act. 
There's misrepresenting um, stats about trans people in prison, completely ignoring decades of evidence that show puberty blockers to be safe and effective. So many examples. And then there's another thing. When people say that trans people can't, without medical approval, self-determine our own genders, that's transphobia, because self-determination is a basic human right. Seeking to remove access to self-determination goes hand in hand with another aspect of transphobia, which is the misuse of language in relation to trans people. So transphobic people will often refer to trans women as trans identified males. And this is a problem on two counts. So first of all, it's showing that that person can't even bear to acknowledge the fact that trans women are women. And secondly, that misuse of language is robbing trans people of the language to quickly and simply describe our identities. Because of the sort of rise in this misuse of language, I'm finding to have to add more explanation beyond I'm a trans man, because when I say I'm a trans man, that because of this sort of muddying of the waters, a lot of people don't even understand what that means anymore. Another thing, the erasure of trans people is transphobia. Trans men and non-binary people that were labelled female at birth are often ignored, and that's because we're inconvenient, because our presence quickly creates holes in arguments around toilets, changing rooms. So it's easier for transphobes to either pretend that we don't exist or insinuate that we're incapable of thinking for ourselves is always one of the two. So here's me, a trans person that is apparently silencing other people. Trans people like me and others that um, work around trans rights are constantly accused of silencing and shutting down debate. So this is by people that have been silenced all over the BBC, in the Times, the Daily Mail, the Guardian. And in reality, the opposite is happening. There's been a systemic, almost total exclusion of trans people from the mainstream media. A cisgender sculptor can be invited onto Newsnight to talk about trans people, but I've not once been invited. I'm the director of a trans organization and I'm an actual trans person. So I'm really glad to see um, tonight that the world transformed, uh, offering trans people the space to talk about transphobia and its impact. And I think we're going to hear some really important perspectives this evening. And if there's one thing that the cis people in this virtual room can do once this event has ended, it's to speak out against transphobia, identify it, name it, challenge it, and don't stand by and let it happen. Uh, thank you, Steve. It was really, really great, Raymond, for some of the other topics we'll be discussing tonight. And for anyone who wants to follow up on some of the things that Che was saying, I'd really, really recommend checking out the What is Transphobia section of Transactual's website. So we'll put a link in the chat now. I just wanted to ask a question that's come through the Q&A box. So you talked about dog whistles and some common examples. Could you talk about maybe how you think allies should respond to any of these dog whistles? Yeah, it's, it's important to just, you know, call it out. Um, and if, you know, you could start it, you know, what did you mean when you're saying that? So, you know, when you're, um, to, you know, um, talking about your concerns, what exactly are your concerns? Name them, name the concerns. And, you know, um, okay, you know, is there evidence for these concerns? And, you know, challenge, challenge what people are saying, because generally there's not the evidence. It's this vague, you know, concern. And, you know, listen to what trans people have said. Listen to all the wonderful um, cis, so that means not trans, um, wonderful um, cis um, allies as well. They're talking about these sorts of things, because often um, the most common of the concerns, for example, is... Um, some, you know, the erasure, the erasure of um, cisgender lesbians. And yet, if you listen to what the majority of cisgender lesbians are saying, there's not an issue. And it's, 
you know, bringing those examples into the conversation, but challenging it and not leaving it to trans people to do because it's exhausting. Definitely. I think that was a really, really great answer. So thank you so much. And, you know, just as the transactional definition of transphobia outlines, transphobia isn't something confined to speech like misgendering someone. It's actually something that appears structurally and harms trans people in so many different variant ways. One of the most terrifying examples of this is the way that transphobia is being mobilized by the right. For example, in Hungary, where the far right government has been using the cover of coronavirus to push through policies that dangerously strip back rights for trans people. To talk to us more about this, I'm really excited to be joined by writer Sean Fay. So Sean, thanks so much for joining us. And could you tell us about what the connections are between modern right wing politics and transphobia? And how is the fear of trans people being mobilized in the UK and abroad? And what can we do about it? Hi, yeah. Um, so probably to answer this question, I thought it'd probably be easy to take you through to start with looking at the far right and, you know, fascist, fascists and the Christian right, and then kind of move to kind of your kind of more standard conservative narrative around uh, trans people. And then perhaps just at the end to look at some of the ways in which uh, quite conservative narratives veil themselves as liberal or feminist. So I think, as you mentioned with the example of Hungary, um, trans people are a strange preoccupation of the far right. Uh, primarily the far right is concerned with white supremacy, with the idea of uh, ethno-nationalism, the idea of creating kind of a racially pure nation state and purging undesirables who are racialized. Um, that's kind of its central preoccupation, but pretty much when they're not talking about race, and I spoke to Adam Ramsey, who's an editor at um, Open Democracy, who did an undercover uh, investigation of far right groups. And pretty much when they're not discussing race, they're discussing gender ideology and what they mean by gender ideology is typically trans people and considering that trans people are less than one percent of the global population it's a strange preoccupation to have and I think that it's worth unpacking why that is and it's because as well as um, narratives of racial supremacy the far right is very invested in narratives of gender supremacy and male supremacy um, a lot of far right uh, activists are um, misogynists and abusive to women in their own lives, we know this. <clears throat> and so they're very invested in kind of traditional gender roles. And of course, trans people are, are seen as a huge threat to that um, because they, by our mere existence, we distort the notion of kind of inherent naturalized gender roles. Um, and the trans feminist in me would say as well that particularly in the case of trans women, if you're that inv uh, invested in kind of narratives of male supremacy and hierarchy, trans women in particular are a huge source of anxiety because if, if you look at the mentality of someone who believes in a kind of natural maleness, trans women are broken men who have kind of given up their, their sort of um, their role within male supremacy uh, in order to kind of live as women. And that's kind of a particular horror, um, the idea of a kind of contaminated masculinity. Um, so this kind of these kind of ideas are very central in a lot of far right groups. And that means that, yeah, when as with Victor Orban, when um, there are ultra right uh, access to, to government, um, it does mean that that kind of quite quickly infiltrates their policy. Hence, in prioritizing that in this year of all years, when they passed emergency powers, the first thing to do is to stop trans people being able to change their legal gender. I mean, even just as a question of priorities. Um, the fact that that was done within days um, suggests how much um, this is, yeah, the central anxiety. And I would say, you know, in, in the US, that, that kind of feeds into the Christian right, the kind of unity between the evangelical Christian um, right movement. Um, and there, that, you know, the focus there, I think, is on preserving traditional roles. And the fact that the Christian right lost a lot of its battles on um, both on reproductive rights and on um, LGB rights, in particular like equal marriage. Um, and if you look at some of the recorded, you know, in the public domain discussions at some of the um, evangelical Christian right organizations and conferences, they're quite clear about their intention is to attack trans people with the intention of severing the kind of LGBT coalition in order to make the whole coalition weaker. And they kind of see trans people as the weakest link because we're a bit further behind in terms of cultural acceptance, where there are less of us. In many ways, we're perhaps a, a little bit more challenging because 
gender is more visual than sexuality. Um, and so it's a, it's a real focus of uh, a lot of Christian right groups in the US, um, groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom give huge amounts of money um, and they have a lot of money to throw into anti-trans campaigning, not just in the US, but around the world. And I think in Britain too. And then I think just moving on to kind of traditional conservatism, if you like, the kind of like, well, like faith flag family conservatism. I think there's been a resurgence of that in Britain uh, with, with the present government. Um, and, you know, that's that's traditional kind of conservatism, really, is that um, a kind of discomfort um, with difference, with deviance. Um, so it finds its kind of natural bedfellow, considering that there are far right and Christian groups pushing this topic so much and creating anxiety and we have a media climate in Britain that now over several years has kind of created an appetite uh, for uh, action on sort of clamping down on the progression or liberation of trans people. It's, um, it's kind of found an ideal ally in our present government. Um, I mean, it goes without saying, you know, our, our prime minister has gone on the record calling, you know, gay men tank top bum boys. I mean, like this is, you know, these people, um, may have slightly veiled themselves in the kind of language of progressivism in the in recent years but they're not <laughs> at their core um and so yeah it's very it's very easy for them to feed into reactionary narratives and i think it's also worth saying that in terms of conservative policy um trans people are can be considered a drain on the state so trump kind of framed us as a drain on the state when he banned trans people from the military because uh, american service personnel get their health care paid um by the federal government and that was his reasoning for it was you're a burden we don't want to pay for you and in the UK it's subtle but you know with the NHS um, trans healthcare is chronically underfunded really badly structured there are enormous waiting times um, there's no incentive um, to kind of resolve that and certainly conservatives don't want to spend the money doing that they don't believe in public health anyway uh, so like socialized healthcare and um, the same thing with like homelessness trans people are hugely overrepresented in youth homelessness and there's been cuts to you know, universal credit uh, housing benefit for young young people so there's a lot of ways in which policy wise to actually combat transphobia it's just incompatible with economic conservatism um and then finally i just wanted to kind of touch on yeah some how sometimes both far-right christian right and conservative uh, narratives around trans people recognize that they might sound too extreme or unpalatable um, for perhaps centrists or for liberals and so they kind of veil themselves so one of the things that the christian right does uh, has done a lot is formed alliances or allegiances with feminists um, who are anti or inclined to be anti-trans you see this a lot in the us with like the alliance defending freedom the conservative think tank i mentioned donating to wolf which is a uh, is an anti-trans feminist organization in in the us and has links with feminist organizations campaigning against trans rights here and it's a realization because you know if you're a christian right person you don't you basically believe trans people are an abomination against god but most a lot of people don't believe in god so you might have to find a different way to um tap into people's anxieties and an easy way to do that is feminism and you know feminism can have potentially in some of its forms particularly um it can yeah it can it can easily feed into conservative very white supremacist narratives about female fragility particularly white female fragility um, about the need to protect um, women and girls um, and that can that can have a feminist hue but it's actually very often a very deeply regressive justification for quite dark um, policy decisions or violence in some cases um, and so certainly it's 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 even though it may not seem like a, a link. And I think it's worth saying that a lot of feminists, on, you know, liberal feminists on the left would be horrified at the idea that they think that they're the same as Trump because they don't think they're the same as Trump. But uh, I would question whether or not the narratives that they tap into uh, um, provide a cover, a rhetorical cover, if you like, for the far right. Thank you so much for that answer. I think it was really useful in seeing the parallels between like America and Britain and how transphobia like, you know, takes a home and like whether it's like Christianity or what people call feminism and stuff. So I think that was really helpful. And we've got a question in the chat and it would be great if you could try and answer it um, quite briefly as I'm quite um, aware of time. But um, you walked us through transphobia and right wing politics really well. But what about transphobia within supposedly left institutions? The leadership of the Labour Party has been largely silent on issues relating to trans liberation. 
despite transphobic motions being repeatedly passed through CLPs and a Labour MP having two members of staff resigning over her transphobia. So why do you think they're being silent on this issue and what can we do about it? Yeah, very quickly, I was going to say one um, sort of strange peculiarity about Britain compared to other places is that here transphobia is not just a right wing position. It can be a liberal position. It can, in some cases, be a left wing position. I think the liberal reasons, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure like Juliet will mention in terms of the media is that just here, liberal media in Britain just seems to be uniquely transphobic. So whereas you have Biden, who's like a centrist in the US, who at least pays lip service to trans equality, you have Keir Starmer, who perhaps is maybe an equivalent kind of centrist here, but it's clearly very uncomfortable. And on left wing transphobia, there is left wing, there is transphobia on the left. Um, sometimes it's justified as we're all individualists, we're promoting cosmetic surgery, and actually we're kind of counter revolutionary. And that was used against gay people. Um, I think in, yeah, I think in, I think also in, in Britain, yeah, it's just the fact that there's a hold of kind of certain narratives within certain key positions in the union movement that means that, um, or Labour CLPs, that means that transphobic narratives kind of hold ground. It's like a vocal minority. That's what, how I would describe it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sean. And just a little reminder to everyone, putting some questions in the chat. Like we will try and answer as many as we can, but if not, we'll try and get some answers in writing for you. So don't think any of your questions are going ignored. We'll do our best to get an answer to you. But yeah, thank you so much, Sean. That was all really helpful. And a reminder for everyone to tweet about this event with the hashtag, what is transphobia to let us know what you think. <laughs> so now we've covered how transphobia is mobilized by explicitly right-wing politics. We're going to move on to talking about the UK mainstream media. Newspapers across the political spectrum have repeatedly given inches of columns to transphobic views, recently prompting 338 employees of The Guardian to write an open letter condemning the paper's editorial stance against trans people. How has it got to this point? I'm really excited to be joined by writer and filmmaker Juliet Jacks to talk to us about this more in detail. So Julia, why is the UK media so transphobic and what can we do about it? Yeah, um, I've only got a few minutes, right? Um, why is the UK media so transphobic? Well, yeah, there are a variety of reasons. Um, firstly, when talking about the media, it's important to clarify, as you just did, that we're talking primarily about kind of legacy mainstream print and broadcast politics and news media. Um, you know, there are a number of um, publications such as like Dazed or Vogue or um, programmes on Netflix, for example, Euphoria or Pose or going back a bit further, Orange is the New Black, um, that, you know, are very explicitly like trans inclusive. Um, so really what we're talking about is what we kind of understand as like tabloid and broadsheet newspapers um, and particularly kind of talk radio. Um, and there is of course a um, supply chain between um, newspapers, talk radio, the BBC through its news and politics programs. Um, and in particular, the, the two biggest parties in our two party system, Labour and the Conservatives. Um, and what we have seen from the mainstream media um, in bringing about Brexit and in bringing about the 2019 general election result in particular is a kind of a hammering of certain narratives, um, really kind of incessantly, just like a handful of, of, of narratives, um, which people end up believing to be kind of true, um, you can go away and watch like Noam Chomsky's documentary Manufacturing Consent on YouTube for a sort of more extended discussion of the way in which this process works. You sort of set something up as a truth through repetition and then anyone wanting to challenge that truth either just doesn't have the time, doesn't have the space in addition to not having the time or the space is often interrupted during or excluded from mainstream media spaces, um, either kind of explicitly excluded through blacklisting or, you know, kind of more subtly excluded by just the creation of a hostile environment for people who want to um, challenge transphobic narratives, for example. Um, so we've sort of already touched on what some of those narratives are and have been. Um, from the right, the narrative just tends to be that 
trans people are just kind of not normal, that um, trans people are a kind of a threat to the gender roles on which conservative society is built upon. So they're a kind of socioeconomic threat uh, and a kind of manifestation of political correctness gone mad or, you know, this has been rebranded as wokeness this year, but it's basically the same anti-PC stuff that we've been hearing in the British media for a really tiresomely long time. Um, as people have also pointed out in the sort of more nominally liberal or centrist media, the narrative tends to be that there's a competition between uh, the rights of trans and non-binary people to self-determination and bodily autonomy um, and the rights of cisgender women to um, single sex spaces and, you know, protection from apparently dangerous trans people. Um, so I mentioned that you see a lot of the same narratives like hammered over and over again. And the ones that reinforce this kind of super narrative, um, you often see um, real attacks on like trans children and, you know, a sort of implication that trans people are like kind of looking to recruit children or are kind of being predatory on children somehow. Um, which kind of you know taps into older homophobic hom homophobic stereotypes about gay men in particular um you often see a kind of a version of a great replacement theory referring to women's sports um this idea that like trans women are only transitioning in order to win at women's sports um and uh another one is about kind of prisons and the safety of women in prisons the idea that like trans women are transitioning um, in order to be moved to women's prisons. Um, you know, the implication of this is that trans people are inherently untrustworthy or indeed criminal. Um, there's a disproportionate focus on um, trans women convicted of crimes in the press, uh, which very rarely um, attempt to kind of contextualize the story or even debunk any kind of outright lies. Uh, most notoriously in 2017 through to 2019, a number of British newspapers ran with the story that the, um, the Soham murderer Ian Huntley was transitioning in prison in the hope of being moved to a women's prison. Uh, the source for this was a single inmate at the same high security prison as Huntley. Um, the story eventually unraveled. One or two newspapers issued very kind of quiet retractions. A lot of the others just quietly deleted the material from their websites without any kind of explanation. Um, so that's a kind of particularly extreme story. Um, obviously something that those of us on the sort of Labour left will be painfully aware of is that in the wake of the 2017 general election, when of course um, Corbyn and the left had real kind of success in cutting through a lot of quite established narratives on the economy, on foreign policy and um, security, for example, uh, and achieved uh, a much better election result than anybody was predicting. There's been a real push in the mainstream media, I think, to um, just hammer the left with certain narratives that basically are saying you are never again going to cut through the things we want to talk about. And we're going to talk about what we want to talk about on the terms we want to talk about them. Um, and this is a kind of strategy that was pioneered, well, maybe not pioneered, but it's recognisable in the way that... Um, the mainstream media dealt with the breaking of trans people into mainstream media uh, in the first half of the 2010s. So myself and others, you know, often saw this sort of tactic of setting up a debate between an anti-trans writer or a gender critical writer, as they tend to call themselves, um, and a trans person. And the terms would always be set by the the journalist who wasn't trans and would often argue on freedom of speech grounds that they could say whatever they wanted about trans people. And then the only option for a trans writer who usually had far less profile than the original commenter um, was to respond on the terms that had been set, which of course were inherently hostile terms. Um, about 10 years ago, I and a number of others managed to break into writing for places like The Guardian and The New Statesman with the sort of express intention of changing the terms of discussion. So we wanted to talk about NHS waiting lists for hormones and surgery, um, as well as, you know, sort of structural problems with the processes that allowed access to those. We wanted to talk about transphobia in the media. We wanted to talk about how austerity was disproportionately affecting um, LGBT people, obviously trans people in particular, because of our reliance on the NHS for a lot of us, um, but also for women. Um, wanted to talk about sort of housing and social safety, things like that. Um, and for a few years, this was reasonably successful, although there was quite a lot of um, 
backlash, especially after the Transmedia Watch Group presented to the Leveson Inquiry, a very long submission about the way that the tabloid media tended to humiliate by kind of outing and monstering individual trans people, often with, with no kind of justifiable public interest. Um, and the way the broadsheets tended to go more for the two lines of attack, either the conservative one or the sort of more centrist one that I've mentioned earlier. Um, so in 2013, you had uh, Julie Birchall, of course, back in the news this week, um, publish an incredibly vicious uh, piece about trans people in general that the Observer published, were really kind of astonished by the level of backlash against it uh, and took it down after 24 hours. Um, Birchall, of course, complained about being silenced. Uh, the piece got republished by her old friend and colleague, Toby Young, in I think the Telegraph, possibly the Times, um, less than 24 hours later. So Birchall had been so silenced that she'd had the same article published uh, by two mainstream British newspapers in the space of less than a day. Um, much worse, I think. I mean, the the, um, the Press Complaints Commission couldn't do anything about this article, it said, because it didn't target any named individuals, it just targeted a group. Um, so they didn't have any kind of um, guidelines or principles to deal with that. Uh, around about the same time, Richard Littlejohn um, kind of wrote a couple of um, opinion pieces about a trans teacher. Um, which caused the teacher a lot of problems um, and the teacher ended up taking her own life. Uh, she taught at a primary school in, um, in Northwest England. And um, a lot of journalists kind of circled the wagons sort of saying that we couldn't blame Little John for this. Um, to me, it felt like an unsurprising consequence of the kind of things Little John spent his whole life kind of publishing. And indeed of the sheer nastiness and callousness of a lot of the British media and its refusal to see trans people as human. And I think a lot of the uh, backlash against trans visibility in the mid 2010s um, came against the kind of establishment of trans humanity. Um, so as some people have already said, um, there, was, there was a real kind of, um, and there was a lot of hostility in particular to reforms to the Gender Recognition Act that would allow trans and non-binary people to self-identify and to get gender recognition uh, without the approval of um, medical gatekeepers, basically. Um, and the way a lot of the press dealt with this was to sort of ramp up this debate culture, this idea that there needed to be a debate about trans rights and trans identities um, that really reached such a kind of pitch of intensity that I and a number of other trans and non-binary writers, particularly mainly kind of trans women, because as um, previous speakers have pointed out, um, trans men have largely been absent from this discussion because they're not kind of convenient for the terms being set. Uh, I and a number of other writers have um, boycotted The Guardian in particular. Um, I've had one piece in The Guardian in the last, I think, just under three years now and it was uh, a short comment piece directly criticizing the Guardian's coverage of this issue which took I think three or four months to get through an editor there um, and that's one one piece by an openly trans writer about trans issues um, in the face of quite a lot more um, by people who aren't trans so uh, they've been quite successful I think in stopping trans people and non-binary people from talking about their own identities on their own terms. Um, and this, this, this reached a peak with the Gender Recognition Act reforms being dropped after a consultation that found quite a lot of support for self-identity, um, self-identification, uh, and indeed Liz Truss leaking proposals to the Times, obviously a lot of Tory governance is being done through leaking to sympathetic journalists, um, and Liz Truss leaking proposals to the Times that suggested that trans people and non-binary people would somehow be banned from single sex spaces um, based on a kind of conflation of the Equality Act and Gender Recognition Act that was talked about earlier. Um, you know, this, this did not become law, but, you know, the intention was maybe not for this to become law, because for that to become a law, you would need cops in every kind of bathroom and changing room. Um, it was more to just create a kind of a climate of fear and anxiety amongst an already beleaguered trans and non-binary community. So what can we do about this? I think we've seen over the last kind of four or five years uh, that it's very hard for us to rely on organizations that we don't have political or editorial control over. Um, you know, I'm quite encouraged by a lot of new media ventures that are um, 
are starting out, a lot of new left media is explicitly trans inclusive um, and will publish trans identified writers talking about trans and non-binary issues, um, been particularly impressed by Black Galdem and the New Socialist. Uh, for example, um, and I think sort of, you know, demonstrating that there is an audience for trans people talking about our issues on our terms and that that is a valid discourse. Um, I mean, if opportunities to work in mainstream media come up, then I think we should think about taking them because conceding that space to our enemies, I think, is um, is, is maybe not a helpful tactic, although... Um, I think actually building the power spaces outside of those, I think is a better tactic for us for us now. Um, and I think to sort of keep um, trans liberation struggles rooted within other struggles. So in opposition to things like the LGB Alliance that explicitly aims to separate uh, the T from the LGB, um, you know, keep working with people who want those to be linked struggles. Uh, and the same goes for like um, trans liberation movements to work with um, movements against ableism and to um, ensure that kind of trans and disability struggles are linked and also um, struggles around uh, racism. Uh, so making sure that we're platforming like trans and non-binary people of color um, because, you know, transphobia and racism, um, you know, are obviously um, both based on, um, you know, opposition to difference from a kind of cisgender, uh, heterosexual, white, norm. Um, so these are all these are all linked struggles and I think we should be treating them um, as such and really just building power in our own spaces I think for the time being. So yeah those those are my thoughts. Thank you so much Julia that was really helpful to hear it from someone who has like you know a first-hand experience of being in them um, oppressional you know newspapers and stuff and sadly we are running out of time so we don't have time for like a verbal follow-up question but if you keep sending them away in the chat hopefully we'll get some written feedback for you so thank you so much for carrying on sending your answers so we're going to move on to the next speaker now but first i wanted to take this opportunity to quickly say that this program of trans political education is being organized completely by trans people within momentum labor campaign for trans rights the world transforms and the labor party lgbt network we are doing this because we want to make a meaningful intervention on a topic that has become so divisive on the left. That's why we're running this project in our spare time and we'd love for you to support us. If you're a trans person or an ally interested in helping run the programme, please drop us a line on transpoliticaleducation at gmail.com. That's transpoliticaleducation at gmail.com. And for anyone who is interested in any more of Juliet's work, we've put a little link in the chat for you to read some. So next up, we've got our final speaker and I'm really excited for us to be joined by a black feminist and researcher, Lola Olafemi. So Lola, can you talk to us about transphobia within feminism and how a feminist understanding of gender can actually help us challenge transphobia? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's been lovely to hear everybody um, speak. So um, as Felix says, I'm gonna talk about transphobia specifically in the context of feminism and how if we adopt a critical understanding of gender, we're better able to understand the ways that um, TERF or trans exclusionary radical feminists weaponize feminism to justify their aims. Um, so feminism, as we know, is a political project with lots of different histories, meanings and concepts attached to it. It doesn't belong to anyone. And I think to understand trans exclusionary radical feminism, uh, which is a recently coined term, it's important to distinguish between two overarching types of feminist approaches first. So liberal feminism and then more critical forms of feminism. So I'd say turf, um, turf feminism um, have, has its origins partly in forms of feminist practice that emerged in the 80s and 90s that saw like male violence, as has been said before, male violence as a fundamental organizing a principle for our societies. And it was specifically interested in this idea of male violence as rooted um, in the body, in socialization, in genitalia. And some arms of this kind of feminist practice did have a genuinely radical structure, uh, critique of inequality in our societies, and some of it didn't. I think in a contemporary setting, some of the most well-known tasks call themselves radical feminists, uh, feminists, sorry, in an attempt to hark back to these legacies. But when we look at their demands and when we look at their goals, their beliefs, and the kinds of uh, feminism they practice, I would say, it's very much more closely aligned to a liberal feminism. 
So liberal feminism at its simplest is a kind of feminist practice that doesn't want to fundamentally change or challenge or set um, oppressive structures. It's interested in protecting and enshrining the rights of the individual as opposed to kind of collective power. It thinks that things can be resolved through reforming institutions, incremental changes, law and policy, anything that doesn't involve the wholesale restructuring of our society. So it wants more women in charge, more women bosses and more women presidents. And then I would say in contrast to that, more critical and or liberatory forms of feminism. So forms of like black feminism, Marxist feminist, um, socialist feminism, for example, is fundamentally unjust. They see kind of abolish hierarchy, uh, uh, sorry, abolish hierarchies. And they believe that in order to kind of build a truly just and livable and pleasurable world, we need to dismantle and abolish and do away with oppressive structures like racial capitalism, for example, um, and the institutions that sustain it. And that's the only way we can transform our lives. So I think what liberal feminism does in the context of kind of looking at capitalism um, in the contemporary age is reduce feminism simply to the act of listening to women. So often people are afraid uh, to critique feminists because they don't want to be accused of kind of silencing women. And we've seen the ways that Tuss used this uh, rhetorical tactic um, to convince allies especially that the best thing to do as an ally simply listen to women. But we know in the world that we live in, there are just lots of different kinds of women, all with different experiences of the world. So the idea that feminism equals listening to women and my understanding of womanhood, my opinions about it, my feelings will not be the same as, as a white woman. So this already tells us that the thing that we call woman is not a kind of universal category that means the same thing to everyone, everywhere, at any time. Um, there are women whose ideas and opinions and actions, as, as we've heard, to say trans people in danger. So firstly, feminism has to mean something more um, than simply listening to women or being a woman. We also have to recognize that it's a political project that seeks to make the world better for everyone, not just women. So broadly, I understand feminism as a political framework and method that we can use to make demands for our freedom and for the freedom of others. So once we subscribe to these kinds of ideas and recognize that the job is to make the world better for everyone, then we see how um, any feminist practice that seeks to exclude people from the scope of it protection or its consideration. It's not a feminism that's seeking kind of true liberation, ergo not a feminism that's worth practicing. So the second, in this kind of second bit, I'm going to talk about gender because often I think people don't have a solid understanding of how gender operates and this sometimes leaves them kind of susceptible to tough arguments. So um, there's no way I could provide increased do justice like shifting and multiplicitous and very personal relationship that we all have to it. Um, but we do know that when we are born, doctors look at our genitals and they assign a sex, female, and it automatically assumes that our sex will correspond to our gender, man or woman. And Tuss argued that there is a meaningful distinction between the two sexes um, and that sex is a natural, pre existing, immovable thing that is true about us. Um, and that there's something essential to our kind of biological makeup that makes us male or female and thus men or women. Other tough arguments, if they're not focused on biology specifically, will argue that there's something kind of immutable and unchangeable about how we're, so, um, we're socialized as men and as women, um, and that, that is fixed and can't change. And I think the, fi the fixedness of our own gender and sex can feel very real because the language that we use um, talk about it is lived in this idea of scientific fact and often we're taught to think of science as objective factual and as true kind of unquestionable but when we think um but what we know about scientific facts or science in general is that science is the result of kind of experimentation uh, scientists often think one true a thing is true and then another person comes along and proves them wrong and i think the sex distinct idea of male and female it's something we constructed to make sense of each other. It's a system we assign to bodies so that we can recognize each other and we map a whole bunch of cultural, political, social, and sexual connotations onto those assignments. So countless historians, anthropologists, gender theorists have written about how the means of um, gender slash sex have changed over time, how they look different depending on geographical location and how sex slash gender, the sex slash gender distinction became solidified at the height of 
colonial rule as part of a kind of ideological program of imperialism. So feminists who seek liberation or more critical forms of feminism have understood sex and gender as a political system of signs and norms and restrictions that, en that enables oppression, basically. Um, and that system of signs tells us what we cannot do, it tells us how to dress, how to talk, what we should like, how to express our emotions. It's a kind of tyranny. So a sex, sorry, slash gender is the way that we communicate who we are to others and to ourselves. So when we talk, walk, speak, dress, we're creating a story about ourselves that aims to communicate who we are to the world. And before that system of science, before that, the invention of that kind of system, um, there was just bodies, right? Before the kind of male-female sex distinction, there was just bodies. Um, and so not only is there not a meaningful distinction between sex and gender, because sex is gender, as far as our society is concerned. And by that, I mean, we expect that female means woman and male means man. When we transgress that system of science, when we do gender incorrectly, or when we, um, we don't live up to what is expected of the category that we've been assigned to, we're punished, some of us more harshly than others. And for trans people, especially, especially punishment can mean death um, and, and frequently does. Um, and think also which women who are seen as kind of failed women because they're not feminine enough or non-binary people who are spoken of as a kind of inconvenient complication or trans men who are often accused of being traitors by turf. Um, so when we understand sex slash gender as not something innate or natural or pre-given or God-given, but as a system of signs with political consequences. And by that, I mean, we know that women, for example, are oppressed in our society and that they're put in danger by that system of assignment. Um, then we see that the goal of feminism is not to reaffirm or reform that system of signs that we call gender, but to, or by giving women like a little more power or trying to gatekeep who is a woman and who is not a woman. It is to end the violence that we experience as a result of the imposition of sex and gender on our lives. So ending that system of signs or abolishing and challenging the sex slash gender binary also means committing ourselves to ending all forms of oppressive systems um, that make it up. So no matter who we are, it doesn't make sense to talk about gender without talking about race and class. As I said before, my, my own personal experiences of womanhood have been shaped heavily by being working class and the racism that I experienced. So in the meantime, on the way to abolishing the system of signs, this process of assignment that we call gender, um, that makes it makes it um, our lives difficult for so many reasons. The system of signs that means that trans people often have to or opt to undergo invasive, costly, draining medical procedures that are controlled and restricted by the state so that they can lessen their proximity to violence, mockery, humiliation, um, so that they may be read in a certain way or experience peace of mind and agency. In the meantime, what do we do? Um, we have to make sure that feminism as a political project invested in building a just world for everyone doesn't become the banner under which we reaffirm the sex distinction or the gender binary or the idea that there is something essential that makes us a man or a woman. Lots of people talk about their own gender in personal terms and gender slash sex feels very real and, and is because our lives are shaped by that system of assignment. But if, um, if we also understand gender as a political system of categorization, as I've explained before, then we understand how saying that, saying something like gender slash sex are constructed is not the same as saying that they're not real and that they don't have tangible consequences because all of us know that they do. So we have to understand that women is not defined by nature and pay attention to the ways that structural oppression places all women, trans and cis, in danger. And the task is to get rid of that danger. That's the only thing that could possibly unite us under this category, woman. And getting rid of danger means committing ourselves to workers' rights, protecting and extending the welfare state, state, making sure that everyone has unmitigated access to medical care. Those are all trans rights issues. And we have to commit ourselves as feminists to ending uh, uh, gendered violence for everyone. And that means we have to realize that the violence we experience as women is not solely defined by um, genitalia or by socialization, it also has to do with capitalist exploitation, borders, prisons, the family, policing, racism, opposition as workers, and so on. So we have to begin to see that any attempt to define kind of woman in a very strict and concrete way will inevitably exclude all of those women um, who do women who do womanhood, sorry, incorrectly. Because womanhood is also shaped by things like whiteness and heterosexuality. So thinking about black women, for example, lesbian women, and so on. So the point is not to strive for a singular universal understanding of women. It's to go in search of 
freedom from that system of science that limits our potential as human beings. And in the public arena, when we're bargaining for more rights or trying to stop the domestic violence shelters imposing or being part of a union dispute or critiquing austerity, we have to understand that institutions and law and policy only understand the language of woman and man. And so when we use that, those political slogans or the language of women's rights, we don't do that because we believe that there is a singular definable thing called woman that we're attached to at, at all costs. We do that because we need more rights. Um, and we're responding to the urgency of the moment. So refusing, you know, categorization means embracing chaos, playfulness, letting go of kind of rigidity. Um, the, the point in the here and now is to do away with the idea that individual people are to blame for the way that they conform or don't conform to the visual script that gender dictates. Um, the task of ending gender oppression is absolutely inseparable from the task of protecting trans people and extending trans lives. Our only enemy in this regard is that system of science that seeks to reduce us and not one another. Sorry, that was quite long. No, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I think it was really good. Like, you know, because the TAFs have such an online presence, I think you really gave some people ways to combat their views and show that they're being hypocritical. You know what I mean? By oppressing people, that's not feminism because feminism is just about an equal society. So thank you so much. And I'm so sorry that we don't have any time for any more follow up questions. But um, Thank you so much for everyone asking the questions in the chat. I'm so glad that everyone's been as engaged with the panel as I've been and sees how great our speakers have been. So yeah, I'd just like to give a final thanks to everyone. And I'm sorry, that's all we have time for, but it's been a great evening and I hope you've all learned so much that I have. Um, we've recorded this event and we will be uploading it to the resource section of the World Transforms website where you can find recordings of our previous two events, as well as a template workshop on challenging transphobia that you can run yourself. So we'll post a link in the chat now. And our final event in the programme will be a fundraiser supporting trans creatives. We'll be platforming some amazing trans performers, artists and poets, alongside union organisers talking about struggles happening in the creative sector right now. This event will happen on Monday the 25th of January in the evening so keep that date free and keep an eye on your emails and on our social medias for more information. So yeah I'd like to give a final thanks to all the speakers, all the organisers of this event and of course everyone watching. I hope you all have an amazing Christmas and I'll see you all in the new year. I've been Felix and if you want to check me out I'm at Felix Mufti on Instagram and at Felix Mufti on Twitter. <laughs> so thank you all so much and I hope you've all enjoyed it.